Welcome Chess Endgame fans. The ending that I'm going to discuss in this video is that of Rook versus Bishop, where each side has an adjacent pawn. I, uh, I attempted to do some research to prepare for the discussion, but was unable to find a great deal of material about this ending. Either it's not treated at all in the standard endgame texts, or the coverage is partial with some mistakes in the analysis that I saw. So I think this tells us that this endgame is you know, not particularly well researched, and so there's scope for a closer study of it. Well, the position the Waldsman has chosen comes from a game between Ivan Farago and Pierre Luigi Piscopo, played in 2005. Ivan Farago is a Hungarian grandmaster and a wily and extremely experienced player. So let's consider the position and see if we can draw a few general observations about this ending. It's G versus F pawn, so adjacent pawns. Now, the strategy for white, who has the rook, is clearly to win the F pawn or to look to give up the rook for the bishop and f pawn. It's changing into a one king and pawn ending. Now, if white is able to induce black into playing f6, then the square immediately in front of the pawn, f5, will become critical. And if black loses control of that square, then he's going to struggle in this ending because of the possibility of exchanging into a one king and pawn ending. Note also that uh, white has a g pawn and so his king is going to have to go around the long side of the f pawn in order to attack it. White's also played g4 which looks a good move because it makes it difficult for black to play f5. Now black's defensive strategy is twofold. First of all, he'll try and make it as hard as possible for the white king to attack the f-pawn. Note, at the moment, there's a force field in front of the white king. The squares e6, f6, g6 and h6 are all covered. Secondly, black will look to break out with a counterattack uh, using his king against the g-pawn once the white king moves away from it. Now this counterattack is much easier to launch with two adjacent pawns than it is with two locked pawns. And so overall, we can say that black's chances of survival and exchange down are much greater with this pawn formation. And in fact, there's no way for Farago to force a win from this position. But what he is able to do albeit with some help from his opponent, is to set up a clever trap. So let's examine how the game proceeded from here. Farago played king f5, starting the plan of moving the king around the long side of the f-pawn to attack it. Black played a waiting move, bishop b2. Now white redeploys his rook, starting with rook b8, attacking the bishop. The bishop moves on to a safe square and the rook comes to b5 and this is to make it much harder for black's king to cross the fourth rank and attack the g-pawn. Black waited, bishop d4, white attacks the bishop which retreats to the c3 safe square. Now white gets on with uh, his king march king d5, while black takes the opportunity to move his king towards the g-pawn with king g6. He's getting ready for an opportunity to launch his counterattack. White plays king d6, and now black's bishop drops back to f6. This is a petty annoyance. It just takes the e7 square away from white's king. White swings his rook to f5, eyeing the f7 pawn. Black carries on with his waiting strategy, keeping e7 covered. So 
So the white king goes to d7, black waits again, and now finally the white king reaches e8 and both the king and rook are attacking the f pawn. Now let's pause here. Now at this point, black made a concession and he decided to play the move f6. Now although this move doesn't lose, it's not an advisable move to make. And in fact, black has got two safer options available to him. The first of these options is to shield the f pawn with bishop f6. Because it turns out that after king f8, bishop g7 check, king g8, the bishop can return to f6. And although the white's king has made it all the way around to g8, penetrating the rear of black's position, black is completely safe here. There's no way for white to win the f-pawn without losing the g-pawn in exchange. So bishop f6 would have been a perfectly feasible defensive plan. But in this position, black has an even simpler defensive option. And that is to say, well, do your worst and to move the bishop to d2. It turns out that if white now captures the f7 pawn, then black's counterattack will be successful. He plays king g5, the rook gives a check on g7, and now black plays king h4, and he's going to follow up with bishop g5, surrounding and winning the g-pawn, and as soon as black liquidates the last pawn, we're left with a straightforward ending of rook versus bishop, which is a draw. Instead, however, black moves his pawn to f6, the same color square as the bishop. Now, as soon as he does this, it becomes very important to retain control of this key square, f5. So white play king e7, heading towards f5, black played king g7, white played king e6, and now the only move is, is king g6, keeping an eye on the f5 square. Now remember that if we, if we were to take away black's f6 pawn and the rook and the bishop, so we're just left with a king and pawn ending. The key squares lie two ranks ahead of the passed pawn. They're f6, g6, and h6. And if white can control any one of those squares with his king, then he's guaranteed to have a winning king and pawn ending. Okay. So in this position, white played the move rook a5, and that generates the threat of rook a8, which black now has to meet. Note that he can't here play king g7 because that would surrender control of the f5 square. White would then occupy it with his king, and he can set up the exchange of rook for bishop and pawn on f6. So instead, black has to move his bishop in order to keep his king on g6. Now the move he chose in the game was bishop h4. And although this is not a losing move, it provides Farago with an opportunity to set up his trap. And so it might have been better to move his bishop to either d2 or e3 in this position. And the idea is that if white now plays rook a8, then that can be met with the counterattack king g5, and black is completely safe. But black played bishop h4 here. And at this point, the wily Farago 
set his trap. And he played the extremely sneaky move, rook to h5. And this is a very neat trap because the psychology lying behind it is, is very good. Now black is safe in this position if his bishop gives up the defense of the f-pawn. For example, black could move his bishop to e1 or indeed to any square on the e1 h4 diagonal to f2 or g3. Those squares would be just as good. And if white plays rook f5, then he can just go back bishop h4. The point is that after the move bishop e1, the g5 square is left vacant. And that means that black can meet rook h8 with the familiar counterattack king g5. Now here white can give a check, rook g8, but black has the move king f4. That's an important move because it, it keeps control of the, of the f5 square. So after king takes f6, bishop h4 check, king moves to e6, then black can surround and win the g-pawn with bishop g5. And as we've seen, once he eliminates the g-pawn, then the ending of rook and bishop, rook versus bishop, is a draw. So, unfortunately, Piscopo couldn't resist the very natural looking move, bishop g5. That's the move that keeps direct defense of the f-pawn and it's also attractive because at first sight it appears as though the rook's now rather embarrassed, stuck on an h5. That's the second element of the psychology that make this such a good trap. However, in reality, white's rook is extremely well placed and in this position it's ready to strike. So Farago played the move rook h8 and all of a sudden, Black is set insurmountable problems. Let's show why Black must now lose the game. If he tries the move Bishop e3, then he loses very straightforwardly. White checks. The only retrieve square for the king is h7. White plays king to f7. And then, however, Black defends the, he, he could play bishop d4 or he could play bishop g5. White will simply play rook to g6. And then he'll capture on f6, give up the rook for the bishop and pawn, and he'll be in control of one of those key squares, two ranks in front of the g-pawn. He'll control f6, and so that's a guaranteed one king and pawn ending. Instead, after rook h8, Piscopo tried king g7, hitting the rook. White moved his rook away to d8. King came back to g6. And now white checks again, getting essentially the same position after king h7, king f7. And here, black played bishop h4. And Farago could, could win simply with the move rook g6, but he opted for another solution, which is just as effective. He moved his rook to b8. Black went king h6, and now an important move, rook b5, scrubbing out any hope of black playing king g5 with the, with the counterattack. Bishop came to g5, the rook came to f5. Black has to play king h7. And now again, rook takes f6 would, would be a sure win. But instead, Farago 
preferred an even nicer finish and he rounded the ending off with rook f1 and this move mates very quickly along the the age file so let's uh, take stock if you find that there's no way to force a win in an ending then there's nothing wrong with setting a trap after all your opponent uh, might fall into it but bear in mind that the best traps are the ones that have a supporting psychology because that makes falling into the trap tempting and increases your chances of winning the game thanks for watching